Okay, so let's begin Parashat Vayeshev. So Parashat Vayeshev, there are really three main parts of the story that occur, and that is, the first thing we have is the story of Yosef, the sale of Yosef. We interrupt the story of Yosef, that's Pedek Lamed Zayin, he gets sold. We interrupt the story of Yosef, Pedek Lamed Het, which deals with the concept of Yehuda and the story that Yehuda has. That's the story of Perik Lamed Het. He goes down, he has children. The story and, uh, ends up him having children with Tamad, who was at one point in time his daughter in law, who then some might have become his wife. And then finally, we resume the story of the sale of Yosef. Yosef in Potiphar's house and then after we deal with the story of Yosef in Potiphar's house we then get to the last chapter and that is Yosef in prison so obviously the story centers greatly around Yosef with a little bit of Yehuda sprinkled in and these are going to be our two main characters amongst the sons of Yaakov so that's that's the first point I want to make, just to uh, keep that in mind about the story who we're dealing with and how that's going to progress. Now, when we take a look at the story, specifically Perik Lamed Vav, we're going to sign something that's really very odd. What I'm going to do here, I'll get the English as well, so whoever wants the English... And if we kind of scroll down into the story, the story begins, Yosef has a dream, he tells the dream to his, to his brothers and his father, his father screams at him, what are you thinking, they hate him, and then eventually his father sends him on a mission to go find his brothers, they go to Hebron, they, they, he leaves Hebron, he goes to Shechem, they're not Shechem, they're in Dotan, the person tells him, no, go there, and finally he gets thrown into the pit, they want to kill him, they throw, you know, Vince has thrown him into the pit, and then they end up selling him to Potiphar. And that's where our story ends. 36 Pesukim. 36 Pesukim, these 36 Pesukim set up the rest of Sefer Bereshit. They set up the rest of the Torah, the, really, and Am Yisrael in Egypt, and Sefer Shemot as well, and then the Exodus from Sefer Shemot trying to return back to the land. So not just the end of Sefer Bereshit, but literally the rest of the four books of the Torah. And notice how it opens up. It opens up, Ele Toledo Yaakov. Here's the story of Yaakov's children. This is the happenings of what's going to happen to Yaakov's children. And we're focusing on this, in the story, we're focusing very greatly on the story of Yosef. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a watershed moment, if we could put it this way, in the history of Am Yisrael, it's probably the most important story that we have, and therefore, it's all the more shocking when we take a look at the story and we realize what's absent from the story. If we scroll down the story, and you see here all these pits who came in front of you, Yosef has a halom. Let's start with that. But yeah, halom, Yosef, halom, and pasuk, hey, Joseph dreamed a dream. And he told it to his brothers, and he said, look, and they hated him for it. He said to them, please hear the dream, which I have a dream. And he tells them the dream. And okay, they, they assume Yosef means it in some way of intent of reigning over them. But what's missing? What words are missing from the dream? Every time we've seen a dream before in Sefer Bereshit, who was involved in the dream? Anybody know the answer? Every time, without fail, we see the word Hashem involved in the dream. Here, it seems to be a dream. It doesn't tell us it's coming from God. And I mentioned that just to show you how odd it is that God's name is not mentioned. I th- scroll down in the story, Yosef has another dream. It's not mentioned. We scroll down in the story, Yosef is looking for his brothers. The word of God is not mentioned. The name of God is not mentioned. Yosef brothers want to kill him. They don't invoke God. They don't speak about God. And then he finally gets sold. No mention of God throughout this story whatsoever. And obviously, 
this is really going to cause us to be very confused. We're dealing with a story that's the single most important story that we have in Sefer Bereshit that's setting up the future of Am Yisrael and God is absent? God is completely not present? Where is he? We can't find him. The rabbis are so bothered by this that the rabbis go out of their way to tell us how Hashem is involved in the story. So, for instance, when Yosef goes to Shechem to find his brothers, he can't find his brothers. There happens to be a person there. He says, no, no, no. They're, they went to do a time. Say to rabbis, that person was planted by Hashem in order to help the Jew, Yosef end up going to Shechem. But still, the dreams, why don't you mention they're from God? Why is that not mentioned? Why is there not mentioned in any which way that God is watching over Yosef? Where is Hashem's in Yosef life? And if we could almost imagine and, and, and take the picture, if you're Yosef, I'm sure that you have to be worried about the question, where is God in my life? You had a dream. You probably assumed, you had two dreams. You probably assume there's somewhat of a divine nature. And all of a sudden, you're with your father. You're, you're clearly connected to God, as I'll show you soon. And you're probably asking the question, as you say, if where is Hashem in my life? And all the rabbis could do, the best the rabbis could answer, as if they were watching, oh, by the way, Yosef, you want to know where Hashem is in your life? He's helping you get sold by your brothers to these people passing by, and that's where God is in your life. It, it's quite shocking for the book of Bereshit, for a book of Torah, to not talk about God, that's for, for the reader, and then for Yosef as well, where is God in his life? Now, if we think this is kind of a coincidence, it's pretty interesting that in the next chapter, in Pedic Lamed He, we have a very similar co concept. And what I mean by that is as follows. We have Yehuda eventually coming out of the story as Yehuda is going to end up creating the Davinic dynasty, the lineage of kings, based on what's going to happen from this story. And, and I say that because we know from the end of the story that Yehuda gives birth uh, eventually to Peretz. Peretz becomes the lineage of David HaMelech. In Megillat Rut, when it's talking about the lineage of David HaMelech, it traces him all the way back to Peretz. So we have, a, again, another watershed moment in the life of Am Yisrael, and where is God involved? And he's not there. The only pasuk we have about God's involvement in that chapter is in Pasuk Zayin, that Ayyad Bechor Yehuda Rabbeinei Hashem Vaymitehu Hashem. Hashem kills Yehuda's first son, and then Hashem kills Yehuda's second son in Pasuk 10. Vayera Be'ayinei Hashem Asher Asa Vayam Gabotu. But the, uh, the actions of Yehuda and Tamar ending up getting married and having children. Hashem not mentioned. Again, who's bothered by this? The rabbis of the Midrash are bothered by this. They find a way to say that Hashem really was involved behind the scenes ensuring this happens. But again, God is known as to be absent. All he's doing, he's killing two of Yehuda's sons. This is the first time we're seeing God's name in the parasha, killing two of Yehuda's sons. But all the machinations that are happening in the book of Bereshit, we don't, we don't see God in this parasha. The next Perek... And this is where I want to start. All of a sudden, we see God's involvement. God comes back into the picture magically. And if you look, and you look at the amount of times, that you have God's name is mentioned, it's quite frequent. So look at Pasuk Bit, for instance. Yosef, okay, now he's soap. And all of a sudden, we, we find a Pasuk that we probably wouldn't expect. But he Adonai Yosef, but he Ish Masliah, Hashem was with Yosef, and he enables him to be, become successful. And almost we want to point, we want to pause and shout out and say, Hashem, 
Really? Now you're here? Now you're going to be with Yosef to help him be a super slave? This is really what's good for Yosef? And where, where were you beforehand? Very interesting. God. Not only that, it's so odd that in Pasuk Gimel and Pasuk Hay, we have again mentions of mentions of Yosef. So in Pasuk Gimel, Vayad, Vayad Adonav, Ki Adonai to. We mentioned Hashem's names twice, that even the master of Yosef was able to see God's hand. Oh, God's providence helping Yosef, and he was blessed in everything he did. And then we see it again in Pasuk, he against Hashem's name mentioned twice. Right in Pasuk Dal, Yosef got the promotion. So now because of his promotion, So what is God doing? He's blessing Potiphar, Yosef's master, because Yosef is involved. So Yosef has this magic touch. Hashem's name, Yud Vav came mentioned five times in the first five Pesukim. After being noticeably absent in the life of Yosef, all of a sudden we have Hashem. And what is Hashem doing? He's enabling Yosef to be a super slave. Oh, thank you, Hashem. So who gets, who reaps the benefits? Not Yosef, but rather Potiphar the Egyptian who had to buy him. And here we want to pause and we want to ask God, what are you doing? God, well, what's happening here? When Yosef is getting sold, you don't know how to interfere. And all of a sudden you're coming to Yosef here now. So we, I'm setting this up because I think there's something fascinating that plays out. We know the story that's going to proceed. Yosef is a slave in, the, in his master's house. And the wife of his master tries to seduce Yosef. Now we have to understand something. I want to make this point clear, just so we understand. When the wife of the master is trying to seduce Yosef, this is not something that's unique to Yosef. This is not something that happens to be because Yosef is so handsome, so he's the only slave that a master, the the people, the owner, the wife is trying to sleep with a slave. The Torah we speaks repeatedly about kemaase eretz mitzrayim being rife. Was immorality. If you want a window into the immorality of Egypt, we saw that very clearly. Abraham went to Egypt for a couple of days, and all of a sudden, his wife, because she was pretty, she ends up being taken, seized by Paro, and taken into his harem. So we kind of get the idea that this is a place where the concepts of sexual immorality are completely blurred. The Torah will warn us about this repeatedly. So what Isha Putifat is doing here is something very normal. And here, Yosef has a, has a challenge. Is he going to give in? Is he going to be like every other Egyptian? Or is he going to do something unique and something different. Yosef, that's it. You're a slave. You're part of the society. Your, your brother sold you. The Hashem did not interfere on your behalf. Okay, it's over. You thought you are going to be special. You thought you are going to be in charge of your brothers. It's okay. They rejected you. That's it. It's over with. There's nothing more to do here. Okay, you're going to be Egyptian. Follow the society. This is what they do. The slave sleeps. This, the slave sleeps with the master. There's immorality rife throughout this place. And Yosef, this do it. It's going to cause your life. It's going to make your life more simple. And clearly, as we find out, it clearly makes his, the rejection of his master's wife makes his life far more complicated. He gets put into prison for 12 years because of this idea. So we would expect, okay, Yosef, let's do it. And all of a sudden, Yosef says something fascinating. Yosef in Pasuk 8 refuses to sleep with her. And he says, no, my master placed the trust in my hand, and, and I don't want to betray his trust. But Yosef says he switches it. And I'll read Pasuk 8, I'll read Pasuk 8 and 9 in the, in the English so you can get the sense. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, my master does not know what is with me in the house, and he has put all that he has into my hand. He is not greater in this house than I, or there is no one greater in this house than I. Neither has he kept me back from anything anything from me but you, because you, you are his wife. So you think Yosef is talking about, and if we, if we would try to finish this pursuit, as Yosef is saying, no, he trusts me, I can't betray him. I have a personal relationship to him. And then all of a sudden here comes the great twist 
and really what I think the, the whole parasha is going to center around of what I want to focus on in this class. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Not sin against my master. V'hatati l'Elohim. I can't sin against God. Yosef, where did where, where this come from? Where, where is Yosef drawing this religious conviction from that God still matters, that morality still matters, regardless of what Hashem does for you? And I think there's so much to learn from this. And I think that the first lesson we'll say is, yeah, Yosef realizes your relationship to God is not a conditional relationship. And this is something I think we only really need to instill in our lives. Yosef is teaching us, just because God wasn't there when you wanted him to be there, doesn't now free you of your obligations to God. Our relationship with God is not one of equals. God is not our friend. God is our creator. And therefore he created me and he obligated me into certain, into certain acts that I need to do to him certain acts of morality and ethics of values, morals. It's not up to me now to decide, oh, God wasn't there for me when I thought he should have been in my life, and therefore I'm going to do whatever I want. I'm no longer bound to God. Yosef doesn't play this game. Yosef understands very well that the relationship, the level of obligation is a one-way level. A man has obligations because of God, because God is the creator. God did not obligate himself to be with man whenever man wants him to be there. Now, God is going to make promises to other people, but Yosef and God don't have this promise. And Yosef, he understands this to the point where he's saying, it's okay, I'm still going to be loyal to God regardless of what happens. And we'll see the idea about how he's going to be loyal to God even after he suffers for being loyal to God. Meaning, right now he's going to go into prison because of this idea, because of his loyalty to God, and we'll see how he behaves in prison. So it's such a tremendous lesson from Yosef. And we call him Yosef HaSadiq for so many different reasons. Not, because he's just, not just because he's withstanding this immoral test that Eshet Potiphar is you know, presenting him, but rather because... He's continuing his relationship with God. He understands that the relationship is not, you can't dictate the terms of the relationship. But I think there's something here, also in the beginning Pesukim of showing God's involvement. And there's something important. And Yosef is going to take this lesson in a fascinating way. Yosef, he's 17. He's wondering, where is God? Hashem help me. If almost somebody was composing a poem for Yosef when he was in the pit, we could probably have one of the world's most fascinating tefillot that exists. That Yosef, the brothers say later, Yosef is crying out to them, begging them to t- save him once they threw him into the pit to take him out. And they don't, they don't take him out. The Torah doesn't go into it, but I'm sure it's an emotionally intense moment in Yosef's life. I'm sure he's not just begging his brothers. I'm sure he's also praying to Hashem as well. I have no doubt. Probably beautiful, emotional, difficult. go unanswered. Yosef confused. He gets to Potiphar's house. All of a sudden, Hashem is with him. And Yosef sits back and says, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hashem is not with me when I was sold. But all of a sudden, Hashem is telling me, no, no, Yosef, I'm still here. So what conclusion does Yosef reach from this story? And all of a sudden, he becomes the master of faith because of the story. He says, no, no, it must be God's here. So if I was sold and God didn't intervene, and now he's intervening on my behalf, it doesn't reflect the lack of ability of God to save me from being sold, but rather it reflects that God has his own plans. God is on his own program. God has his own machinations that I am not aware of. And he submits to God's plans. Does he want to be in Egypt as a slave? Definitely not. Would he like being back in his father's house? 100%. Okay, that's not in the cards. He prayed, God didn't answer. What am I going to do? God must have a plan. And therefore, he says, Okay, I'm continuing. God is clearly present. I'm going to continue my relationship with God. It's not, not again, it's not on my terms. It's not what I like. It's not what I want. But I know he's here. And therefore, I'm going to continue my relationship. This reaches the maximum 
conclusion, the radical conclusion Yosef reaches because of this is something fascinating. When the brothers come back, the, the brother and Yosef reveals himself, the brothers are petrified that Yosef is going to punish them. And Yosef says, no, don't worry, I'm not going to punish you. Okay. God sent me here, not you. You're irrelevant. Now, the brothers are so astonished by his response that they conclude it must be he just wants to get the family back together because of Yaakov. And when Yaakov dies, then he's going to punish us again. So there's a fashion, fascinating story in Parashat Bayehi. After Yaakov dies, the brothers, and according to many commentators, they actually lie, and they go to Yosef and say, your father said before he died that he commanded you to forgive us and not take a vengeance, take revenge on us because of the act that we did. They're lying because they just can't imagine that Yosef will forgive them. So they're trying to be as desperate as possible by fabricating a lie in order to hopefully Yosef won't take revenge against them. And they actually fall in front of him to say, Here we are, we're your slaves. And Yosef again says, No, no, it's okay, don't worry. No, 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 guys, nothing to worry about. I don't know what you're doing. It was God's hand. God sent me here to provide for you. It's not you didn't do anything. God did it. You understand? Yosef's the biggest act of injustice done to him. He's able to forgive because he says God would have stopped it if he didn't want it to happen. So God clearly wanted it to happen. So therefore, I could forgive them because it's not them. It's God. Now, is he abdicating the responsibility from them? No, no, he's not abdicating responsibility from them. He understands that they had free will in their actions, and then the rabbis point out Yosef definitely didn't need to end up this way in Egypt. There's a lot of midashim that make this point, but at the end of the day, Yosef is saying, what am I going to do? This is what God's plan. He wanted me to be sent to Egypt. Okay, so I got sent to Egypt, and it ended up that God had his plans. But now, it's very easy for Yosef to say that towards the end of his life, where he knows where he's going to end up. But here, the fascinating part of the story is Yosef is maintaining this idea. Before he knows what God's plans are, he just knows maybe God has a plan. Maybe I hope God has a plan. And therefore, Yosef goes and he does what, what he does. And he says, no, no, I'm going to be loyal to Hashem. Yosef making a decision. By the way, I want to point out something. What's at stake in Yosef's decision right now? If Yosef doesn't make the decision he makes... He's not going to be part of Am Yisrael if he sleeps with the wife of Potiphar. If he says, that's it, I'm abandoned, my family sold me out to slavery, I'm going to leave that life behind. Okay, I'll be an Jew- uh, Egyptian slave, a successful Egyptian slave. So this is his destiny. He's never going to grow out of it. He's not going to be going to jail. He's not going to end up being in front of Pot- Oh, that's from a practical standpoint. But additionally, meaning what it means is Yosef is saying, okay, I'm going to be an Egyptian. Okay, you're going to be an Egyptian. Yosef, we'll see you later. To the point, the rabbis express this in a, follow, in a fascinating way. What happens? Okay, here he says, I, am not, I can't sin against God. Eshet Potiphar constantly pressures him. And then there's one day and the day that he ends up being sold into, uh, go, uh, so, so, the day he ends up being in prison is because she tries to seduce him when nobody's in the house and she grabs his, his clothing. What happens there is something fascinating. What happens... When she, when she takes his clothes, the rabbi says as follows, in Pasuk Yud Aleph, about this time he went into the house to do his work, and then none of the men of the house inside. And the rabbis point out like this. There are two opinions. One says he was entering innocently, but the second opinion says, no, 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 Yosef was going to do his work. He was sleeping with 45. Finally, he was ready to cave. It was too much. He was ready to cave, even though he stayed loyal in the beginning, but eventually eroded over time and probably the doubts that he had. Am I, am I ever going to go back? What am I doing this for? What's the purpose of this? All these natural doubts that it makes sense for yourself to have. And he's ready to give in. And then, and then the rabbis say he sees the image of his father. And what happens when he sees the image of his father, the, rabbi, the rabbis tell us like this. His father tells him, Yosef, at the end of the day, you want to be included as part of the 12 tribes. Your name is supposed to be written on the breastplate of the Kohen Gadol. And if you sin right now, you're going to be not written. You're going, your name is going to be erased. So therefore, 
therefore, don't do it. Don't commit the sin. If you commit the sin, you're going to be out of Am Yisrael. So that's, that's really to highlight, to show you what's at stake in this story. It's a very powerful story. Yosef really needs to choose who is he going to be. Is he going to be a stranger in the land? Or is he and be loyal to these Jewish ideals, ideals that the people, only other people who are loyal to these ideals are the people who betrayed him? And he's going to choose to do so because of this relationship with God that exists? Or is he going to choose to be a regular Egyptian and thus given to the temptations of the time? And indeed, Yosef stays loyal and he goes to jail. So again, you must think like Yosef, okay, at this point in time. <laughs> and by the way, what type of jail is it? It's fascinating that the jail is the same type of idea where he was thrown into beforehand. He was thrown into a board, a pit. The jail is also referred to as a board, as a pit. So he's getting nowhere in life. He's, he's literally, he's going backwards. At first he was in a board thrown in by his brothers. And now once he passed the test and stayed loyal to God, are you think, oh, oh, did he get anywhere? No, he ends up, he's still in a pit. Still in a pit. However, we find something nice. If you look at Pasuk 21, so Yosef is in the pit. But Hashem was with Yosef and showed him kindness, and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. So, no, no, no. The Hashem is still with him. Okay, Yosef, you're in the pit, but I'm going to show you that, that, fine, that fine connection, that little bit of light. No, no, I'm still going to be with you, Hashem. A way of assuring yourself, yourself, stay with me. I have something doing. I have a machination that's supposed to come to fruition, but I need you to. I need you to. I need you to stay with me. This hang in there, and we see it again in Pasuk Gimel, Pasuk twenty-three at the end of the chapter. So again, it's three pesukim, three shem hashems. So in the first five pesukim of the chapter, God mentioned five times. In the last three pesukim of the chapter, God mentioned three times. A total of eight times, God is with Yosef. But again, in the times where we say, okay, what good is it doing? It doesn't help Yosef. There's only one time where we see it the opposite way, and that's when Yosef is saying the hatati leluhim and Yosef being loyal to Hashem. So there's this very odd relationship that first lands, right? I mean, obviously, me knowing the end of the story, but if you're Yosef, you must be very confused. Hashem is with you, that he's not with you when you really need him to be with you twice, and you end up in the pit twice. So what good does it do to you? So we say, okay, maybe finally he's giving up on it. No, but we turn to chapter 40, and we see when he's dealing with the butler and the baker, and we see something fascinating. He sees them upset. Yosef tells him, why are you upset? And they tell him in verse 8, Perek Mim, chapter 40. But you may love halom halam ru for ten and oto. We had a dream, there's no one who can interpret it. But you may love Yosef, halo the Luhim Pitrunim, Sapiru Dali. No worry, interpretations up to God. It's okay, tell me. It's okay, I got you, I'll help you out. It's not really me, Hashem will help you. Okay, just tell me, maybe we can make it work. So, so we say, oh, oh, Yosef, he's still loyal to God to the point where he's not even going to take credit for what he's doing, giving the credit to Hashem, again, recognizing Hashem in his life. So you say, okay, big deal. Well, and if he took the credit, where was he going to go? It's actually fascinating what happens if we scroll all the way down to the end of the chapter, the last two verses. Yosef begs the, the butler, listen, remember me when I get taken out of this, and help me get taken out of this prison, I'm innocent, right? If you want to see the Pasuk, the Pasuk is, is in Pasuk uh, 14. Please, but remember me when it will be well with you and please show kindness to me. Make mention me to Pharaoh and bring me out of this house. For indeed, in verse 15, I've stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews. Here also I've done nothing that should put me into the dungeon. In the Hebrew, it's the word board, which means pit, the same pit he was thrown into. So Yosef asking him to remember him. And what happens towards at the end of the chapter, the last pasuk, there was a chad, son of Mashkim at Yosef, son of Mashkim forgets Yosef, he doesn't remember him, he forgets him. 
No, no good. So imagine you're Yosef now. The one time you tried to show some initiative and you said, maybe you could, I could get some help, Hashem will help me. No, it doesn't work. He, not only does he not remember, he forgets him. The rabbis say, that from based off the next pasuk, he forgets him for how long? For two years. Yosef is languishing in the prison. He said, maybe the butler is going to do something. He wakes up one day, nothing happening. He wakes up the next day, nothing happening. Finally, after a couple of months, Yosef probably gets the hint this is not happening. Say so the rabbis, you know why? Yosef, you know what mistake you made here? Yosef will tell you, you mention, please take me, you, you take me out of this pit, Hotsetani. You forgot to say, and if you remember me, God will take me out of the pit. You forgot to mention Shem Hashem. Yosef, the one time you forgot to mention Shem Hashem, you're gonna, Hashem is going to remind you, you should have mentioned. Look at the level of, of, of faith in which we, the rabbis are saying Yosef should have, could be held at, which is a tremendously wild idea. Now, here's my favorite one. We turn the page and leading into next week's parasha in chapter 41, Paro has his dreams. And Paro is all perturbed. What's the explanation of my dreams? He goes, and all of a sudden the butler finally remembers and the butler says, oh, I know a guy. I know a guy. Okay. Where's the guy? Okay, fine. Go get Yosef. So they go, they get Yosef, they take him out of the, out of the prison. Look at verse 14 of chapter 41. The Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon. Again, the word board. He shaved himself, changed his clothing, came into Pharaoh. Oh, okay. Joseph's big moment. Pharaoh tells him, and he's speaking to some guy who is in prison. Pharaoh, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I've dreamed a dream. There's no one who can interpret it. I've heard it of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Okay, Joseph, I heard you had a dream interpreter. What does Joseph say? Classic. In verse 16, Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Bil'adai. Elohim ya'anet shalom paro. No, 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 it's not about me. Nothing to do with me. It's if like rectifying his mistake. But this is a fascinating idea. Look at this guy. This is all he could think of is God, except for that one brief moment where he told the butler, no, take me out. Okay, fine. But here, all he's thinking about is God. He has his big moment to shine, his big moment to be relevant, to, to, to have a future. And Yosef instead says, no, 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 it's up to God. So it's fascinating. What we really we're learning is why is God absent here? Why is God absent from the sale? Why is God absent in the creation of the Davidic dynasty? Where is God? And the answer is because it's not a question of why, why is God not doing stuff. It's a question of are you finding God? Are you connecting to God? Are you basing yourself off the morals of Hashem? Both Yehuda and Yosef have to face these acts of morality. Yehuda has to publicly admit that the daughter in law he's put on trial and ready to burn at the stake being pregnant, that really he made a mistake and really he was the one who impregnated her and therefore she doesn't need to die because of the laws of Yibum that applied at the time. Yehuda has to find God. Okay, once he finds God, then God will allow those children to be part of the Davidic dynasty. You're claiming responsibility. This is what I need as a king. Okay, Yosef has to find God. So our parasha is all about, not about whether or not God is going to do for you. But the question is, are you going to be loyal to the precepts, to the morals that God is expecting of humanity? Here's the first shift that we have in Sefer Bereshit, really in a fundamental way, where the focus is placed not on God's actions, but rather on man's response to what God is allowing to happen. And it's something so fascinating, because it's going to take go full circle, and eventually we're going to realize that, no, no, God had these plans in mind, and these are what a potential of what they could become, and eventually leading to the Davidic dynasty, and eventually leading to Yosef becoming the head of Egypt, and Yosef obviously really, like we mentioned, recognizing that message. But it all begins with the sense of humility, the sense of understanding that God doesn't operate just because we want him to. God operates in his ways, and we have to find him, stay loyal to him, even though when we feel we don't see him. That's the greatness of Yosef Hasadik. So I think this message, if you take this message, we'll realize how relevant it is for the holiday of, I, I would love to say Hanukkah, but almost, and I'll touch on Hanukkah in a second, but really, perhaps most relevant in the holiday of Purim. 
who finds themselves in a very similar situation to Yosef. That they're thrust into a situation where they could be successful, and all they need to do is just forget their connections to the people, they stop asking why did God this, did, do this to you, and abandon God, and uh, enjoy the success that you have. Who's the perfect example? Esther. Esther is in the same situation. God does something terrible to her, making her being chosen before the king's harem. Right? Keep in mind. Okay, she she's the favored, she's the favored uh, concubine by the king. She wins the beauty contest. Okay, wonderful, very nice. So she's like this de facto queen, but she's not really have her own power. Okay, but enjoy your success. Be a thing. Be be go part of the kingdom, enjoy your success, just like Yosef had the ability to do so in the house of Potiphar, and just live life. And no, they put themselves in danger and they sacrifice themselves on the line to remain loyal to the original ideas of the people of where they come from, even though they have every reason not to. That's this idea, I think, really, it highlights on the story of Purim, more specifically, the idea of being in Galut, and instead of asking God, how could you allow me to be there, but going and realizing that there might be some plan in mind, and not questioning God's plans, but staying loyal to him. The story of Hanukkah, where we talk about, Hashem ki dilitani, right, this is more shir Hanukkah to bayit ehidin, Periklamid, what what we say is as follows: Hashem he alita mit sheol nashi he tani miyadi board. Hashem, you saved me from the pit. But the question always is: How did you get into the pit? What what happened that you fell into the pit in the first place? How did you get into this act of trouble? And the mizmor's take on it is very interesting. The mizmor's take is that sometimes we forget about Hashem. We don't, we're not doing things properly, and therefore we, we get ourselves into the pit, Hashem takes us up. Now, you could very easily take it in a different way. You could very easily say when bad things happen, you could say, oh, God wasn't stopping, God wasn't helping me. And instead, the message that Yosef is trying to teach us is, no, 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 forget about God. Stop thinking about what God was supposed to do. View it as your problem. Now, why am I mentioning this? What was Yosef's problem that he ended up in the pit? And the answer is clear. The rabbis present them as, especially in the Midrash, but really the first chapter of the Awa Parasha, they present them as arrogant. He's arrogant. He's walking around telling his brothers to dream, seemingly just to gloat over them. And he's walking around with his Ketonet Pasim, and he thinks he's going to rule over his brothers, and his father has to tell him, Yosef, what are you doing? How could you walk around saying these things? What are you trying to do? You're trying to gloat? And he ends up in the pit because of it. There's no doubt. It's the failure of his actions. How does Yosef learn from it? How does he reinterpret the dream of the 11 bundles of wheat bowing down to him? He tells his brothers later, you know why I'm here? Not to rule over you. When they bow down to him and they say, Yosef says, no, no, God sent me to provide for you. It's not rulership. Your stalks bowing down to my stalk is specifically stalks that I'm going to provide for you. Not that I'm going to rule over you. Yosef realizes. It takes some time. This experience takes some time to realize that he was too arrogant and he changes his approach to how he's dealing with his brothers. I mean, this is something that's very important for us to realize uh, that Yosef too, not only does he stay loyal to Hashem, and not only does he not question Hashem, where are you? But there's actually now we're adding an additional element that Yosef is taking responsibility and realizing that maybe he's in trouble because of his own actions and also rectifying his actions and understanding that, okay, yes, God has a plan and it could all work out, but at the end of the day, there's something wrong and I have to behave better. So when you take all these factors together, yeah, and we, we look up at Yosef, we say, wow, what a guy. But it's funny because the Torah puts that same story in Yehuda as well. Yehuda suffers because of his son's actions. His two sons die. He has the ability to kind of leave, to kind of ignore, let Tamad, his daughter-in-law, be burned. And instead, he takes the responsibility, realizes his actions, and eventually, what's more interesting, what goes undisclosed in the text, is that Yehuda started off, that story, he wasn't with his brothers. He was in a different place, married to people. What's he doing with these people? 
eventually he returns home. Both Yehuda and Yosef, it's a story of redemption, how to realizing their own failures, they're correcting their failures, and realizing what Hashem does to them. They're not challenging it, they're accepting of it and using it as a way to become better. These are the people who we learn our basic approach of faith and how to how to go through life. This is this is a story of why these people are so important to us. So Parashat Vayeshev and the question of finding God in our lives and the relevance of his actions, Yehuda and Yosef, the ones who are teaching this message very in a very powerful way. So we'll pause here for today and hopefully we'll be back next week.